hello everyone and welcome to the ninth session of NZX's virtual global dairy seminar for 2020. Uh, just as a quick update to begin, um, for those who watched Tuesday's education se uh, session by Jason Bray on exchange for physical trades, yesterday just before the market closed, we saw the first ever uh, NZX dairy derivatives EFP trade go through the Homework Powder futures market, uh, which was 48 lots of December Homework Powder trading by EFP at $3,115. So it's great to see the market understanding these tools uh, off the back of the seminar uh, and trading them. Today's session, uh, we've got David McGowan, uh, who's gonna give us an update around how oceanic ingredients markets are shaping up, uh, as well as a look at the farm gate situation. Um, Dave is the head of commodity trading at Fonterra and has been involved in NZX dairy markets uh, since day dot, so back in 2010. Uh, just some admin before we start, uh, please make sure to download the event apps to take advantage of our networking features, as well as to access Q&A, live polls uh, and recordings. Um, and a link to the web version can be found in the chat box of your go-to webinar now. Um, if you want to ask a question in the app, just click on the live Q&A polls uh, button, which will open a new screen uh, and then click the Q&A tab at the top. Uh, so if you have any questions for Dave today, just sub submit them through the app. We'll try to get through as many as possible. Um, you can also vote uh, on them uh, to bump them up the list in order of priority. Uh, attendees have been muted, but this shouldn't impact you hearing us. Uh, if you're having trouble, just see the troubleshooting uh, button on the left of your screen. Um, we'll also be sending out a recording of the webinar afterwards so you can re-watch anything that you miss. Uh, one more item, so we're running a poll today as we have been throughout the, the Global Dairy Seminar. Um, today's poll, how much homework powder will New Zealand export in 2021 relative to 2020? Uh, majority, which is only six voters so far, saying more. The other options about the same, less or don't have the foggiest. Um, so you can submit your responses to that on the app as well. I will now pass on to Dave to kick off today's session. Right, hi everybody, um, and thank you Nick for the introduction and uh, to the NZX for the opportunity to speak to you all today. Um, as Nick mentioned, uh, my name is David McGowan, I'm the Head of Commodity Trading at Fonterra uh, that sits in the uh, group called Central Portfolio Management uh, essentially responsible for collecting uh, and optimising the the milk that Fonterra uh, processes uh, and turning that into the the maximum uh, maximum value products that we can uh, for our farmers. My role is focused on managing commodity price risk using financial markets and supporting the development of the financial markets for dairy. Uh, I have been in the industry for many years. I've been uh, in this role for the last 10 years or so, uh, and fantastic to see the, the milestone of, of uh, an exchange for physical transaction occur just last night. Um, I'll kick off by talking through the agenda. Oh, can you see my screen? So today I was asked to provide a, an outlook for the dairy markets from Fonterra's perspective. Uh, and obviously I'll talk a little bit about what's going on in New Zealand in, in that process. Uh, I'll provide a high level outlook to start with on global dairy supply and demand, and then touch on some of the key drivers that will change the dairy landscape. Uh, many of which have been covered in some of the talks that we've had during this event. Uh, I also want to take a closer look at what's happening from a supply and demand perspective for some of the key commodities with a, with a focus on what's going on in Oceania and where we see that sitting right now. That'll give you some insights into where we see the markets. Um, and finally, I'd like to, to touch on some of the external factors that could move the markets in 2020, 2021. In terms of the global dairy outlook, I would start by saying the outlook 
for dairy remains really strong. Um, we've been through a massive global shock, and while there are clearly have been some disruptions in the market, in the market's moved, the market has actually moved through these through those disruptions remarkably well. This slide summarises by region a long-term summary of expected supply and demand dynamics around the world. Essentially, we can we expect to continue to operate in a world where supply and demand supply will be driven by the US and Europe, uh, with New Zealand playing a key role in global dairy traded commodities. But our outlook is for New Zealand milk growth to be uh, flat, in, in other words, um, uh, not increasing over the next five to 10 years. There are clearly some other important milk pools, uh, including India, China, and Latin America. And while they may become important from time to time due to short-term surpluses and or deficits, by and large, the production growth is likely to come from Europe and the US. On the demand side, I guess we we could split uh, that into sort of three groups: the developed markets, Japan, Europe, and the US. Uh, China, I would typically think of as as a single market, uh, and then the developing world. Uh, and when we look at uh, at Japan, um, we think that will remain a high value market uh, and a very important one. We expect to see continued strong demand from that region, uh, given its shrinking milk supply. China is going to remain a huge uh, import powerhouse. Um, we expect that that will continue to grow at around 4% per annum. It's likely to remain the number one uh, country in terms of milk powder import. Uh, and we would expect it to start to uh, go up the ladder in terms of cream and cheese imports. India gets a special color uh, all of its own. Uh, it's quite hard to say how that will play out. I think I, I recall being asked the question of what impact India might have on global dairy markets over the next five, five to ten years. About ago, sorry, I just got a message that my audio wasn't working. But anyway, I'll continue. Um, my response to that at the time was that I, I expected that it wouldn't. Uh, wouldn't play a major role. Uh, and I would argue that that's probably been true. Uh, and our view is that uh, whilst India has enormous potential, it's likely that the supply and demand situation in India will, will be relatively balanced um, with occasional surpluses uh, or deficits that uh, impact the globally traded market. In terms of sub-Saharan Africa, it's very much an affordability play. Um, the Europeans dominate that market. We uh, we do have the capability to compete in that space with lower cost milk powder formulations when uh, when the economics make sense, and we'll continue to do that. And the Middle East and North Africa regions is likely to deliver moderate growth, and, and you'd expect that uh, if European milk supply continues to increase, that they will they will compete aggressively for that demand. In terms of global trends, uh, I think there's some really interesting and significant changes in agricultural markets. Uh, and and I think it's worth pointing out that COVID-19 has amplified it and, and possibly advanced some of those trends uh, in quite a material way. In terms of food security, that's been a key theme in the market for many years now. Countries in Asia and the Middle East have clear objectives around food security, and uh, and we'd expect that to continue to be high on the agenda. As COVID-19 unfolded, I think this definitely played a part in the stabilisation of the markets. Some supply chains were disrupted, it exposed the just-in-time approaches that many have, and it, it no doubt created a rethink on that approach. I think it started to feel a little bit like the market was trading, like it was preparing for war. Not that it expected a war, but COVID-19 uh, essentially had become an issue that uh, the market treated like one. And so demand came forward as, as markets stabilised um, to ensure that, that people had supply, not only at a country level, but also at a manufacturing level, um, where components, or at least the lack of components, 
could essentially stop a factory from operating and uh, result in uh, problems in the supply chain. As it turned out, the supply chain was, was pretty resilient. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see how that, uh, those concerns and risks are, uh, are approached over the next few, few years. I've also seen, well, and we'll continue to see changing demographics. Um, there's been some really important developments uh, around that and uh, an increasing focus on uh, nutrition and healthy aging um, is likely to continue to play out. Um, the importance of diet in relation to health and well-being and the ability to fight disease has also definitely grabbed some more attention than normal in recent times and, and dairy is in an interesting position to be able to, um, to leverage that and, and deliver products that the market is looking for. Arguably COVID-19 has taken a bit of attention away from uh, sustainability agenda but there's no doubt that will remain an important issue. Uh, and so I guess at a high level, uh, it's reasonably clear where the supply will come from. The dairy market, like all industries, will will face a, some rapid changes, and some of those changes appear to be occurring more rapidly than uh, than may have occurred in the absence of the pandemic. Um, I'll turn my attention to the supply and demand update for 2020. Uh, if we start by having a look at overall milk production growth, uh, we are seeing um, growth pretty much balanced against the demand uh, growth picture. Uh, obviously, you can see clearly there that the Europe, European Union and, and the United States are, are play play a dominant role, as I've already mentioned, in, in delivering the growth uh, of milk production that's required to meet demand, and that uh, we are seeing diminishing growth from New Zealand. Given, given this outlook, uh, I guess we, we're, what we're basically saying is that milk growth is slightly exceeding uh, expected demand growth, or at least the range of demand growth that you would expect. Uh, Australia and Argentina have clearly outperformed in, in recent times. I'm not sure that will persist. Uh, and if this is how, how the milk production plays out through to the, to the end of the year, then you'd have to say that uh, the market looks to be uh, in the most balanced position it has been for the last decade. Uh, historically, there have been very large swings of uh, milk production growth where either growth or uh, where the growth is either materially exceeded or or underperformed against the largely uh, static demand growth. If we take a closer look at New Zealand milk production, we're uh, approaching our peak now. Uh, the chart. Uh, shows you uh, where we we're at at the middle of August. Um, we're now obviously into into October. Um, the season is on track as we head towards the peak period of milk collection, which is right about now. Uh, our collection last year was 15, 17 kilograms of milk, down about 0.4% on the previous year. Essentially, the balance of that was that North Island production was down a little and the South Island production was up. Um, roughly by about 2%, uh, driven by dry conditions in the North Island. In 2020-2021, we're, we're forecasting milk collections to be slightly higher at 15.25. Certainly the price in, in the market uh, is conducive to, uh, to deliver that sort of number. And, and that forecast is based on a normal, normal weather conditions. Early in the season, I would say we could describe them the, those conditions as normal, but there is some dryness developing in the North Island, so um, we'll see how that plays out. In terms of the weather forecast, uh, we have a La Nina being forecast, uh, what, uh, and essentially what that should mean is that 
we should see wetter conditions in the north and northern parts of New Zealand develop during October, November, December. Uh, we haven't seen that yet, uh, and we are seeing soil moisture levels a little bit below where they where they have typically or where they normally are, particularly in the north of the North Island. Uh, in terms of La Nina. Uh, Across the season, you would typically expect to see a little bit more rainfall in the northeast of the North Island. Um, not a not a very large producing region, and less less rainfall in the South Island. The South Island's less exposed to rainfall reductions, given um, given a, a large part of that uh, region is irrigated. So. Typically uh, a little bit more neutral, um, but as always, uh, we see material variations across regions. So it'd be uh, be way too early at this stage to call whether make a call on whether whether will have an impact on uh, on milk production in New Zealand just yet. If we have a look at the whole uh, whole milk powder supply and demand balance. Uh, Essentially, in, in this market, we uh, New Zealand started the calendar year with a lower stock position due to some demand go, coming forward in 2019. Um, we expected that to sort of soften uh, demand in the early part of 2020. Um, and as we progressed through the season, we would expect to, to sort of uh, see that uh, stock position end up slightly higher. Um, and we would expect to see... Uh, stock being marginally higher uh, across the season but this pretty much reflects um, the balanced perspective and against the typical major major origin closing stock position of 500 or 600,000 tons then you would you would say that that's not likely to move prices too much and in essence that's that's what we're seeing in the market in terms of prices and you've heard people talk about uh, homework powder prices trading in the range of 2600 to 3300 uh, since early 2017 um, and so there's nothing really in in the supply and demand balance that gives us any indication that the market would would trade outside that range at this stage In terms of the skim milk powder market, that's a little bit more interesting, uh, and it does look like that uh, market is starting to tighten a little. But equally, there are regional imbalances. New Zealand and Europe looks to be tightening with a more balanced position in the US, primarily due to weaker, U weaker Mexico demand. Um, but that should be broadly supportive for prices, and given New Zealand reached parity with homework powder briefly it's certainly performing well relative to that stream um, I suspect that no doubt as the skim stream becomes more attractive the balance will normalize and if the U European and New Zealand stocks do tighten uh, then there will be export opportunities for the US so I would expect um, that market to balance and I would also expect those prices to to remain reasonably well correlated um, as we as we get through 2021. In terms of butter, um, that has arguably been the most impacted by COVID-19 given its reliance on the food service sector, sector um, and, it, and it has been underperforming. Um, we are expecting a reasonable drawdown as we approach the end of the year, but um, that's unlikely to solve the stock overhang which is most pronounced in the US and will take some time to work through. It may take improved US exports to rebalance that picture. Um, and given the US has not needed to export butter for many years, that may, ta that may take a little bit of time to mobilise, but they have done it before. Also, I, th I think it would be fair to say that based on historical stock positions and the price, um, the price has already found its way to levels where you would expect marginal demand to emerge. So it's quite possible that the price for butter has already done uh, done the work that it needs to do to, um, to start seeing demand come back into that market. Um, our process 
in terms of the S and D analysis is is very much around focusing on understanding the stocks at the origin. So you you, you see that the major um the the major origins are where we focus our attention in trying to understand the stock balance. Um, and that helps us form a, a consistent basis for evaluating what's going on in the market. But the market has been through an extraordinary period and so it's worth sort of testing our thinking and you know, I've started to ask myself the question of whether stocks are building at the destination. There is anecdotal evidence and reports of, uh, of increased purchases due to concerns that I mentioned around food security, but also um, disruptions to supply chains, um, and then also increasing geopolitical tension and, uh, and between, the China, between China and the US and, and Brexit, uh, is also likely to come to a head as as we approach the end of the year. So it's, it would be understandable for markets to be starting to raise inventories. I looked at a few charts to see if there was any evidence of that. Uh, and, and if you have a look at some of these charts, I guess what stands out is that China is uh, imports of about the same if you look at the period from January to July. Um, that's interesting given that we know that uh, they produced quite a lot more whole milk powder domestically during the, the COVID outbreak. Um, and so that's a, a pretty robust uh, result uh, through that period. Um, you can also see that if you look at uh, countries like Saudi Arabia, they have really picked up the pace in, in products like whole milk powder, skim milk powder, and also butter. Um, where they feature as a, as a market that has increased uh, its butter imports. I'm not sure though that this is conclusive. Um, clearly there's, uh, there's some data that we're still waiting to, to see through to the end of the year. Um, we have seen, have seen good demand, uh, but I'm not sure that this uh, is conclusive enough uh, to suggest that we are seeing uh, inventory build at the destination. And it's quite a bit harder to get visibility of that. Uh, so something we're very conscious of, but there's nothing that really clearly points to a dramatic stock build there. So in, um, in summary, in terms of the S&D, uh, we've seen some major disruptions to supply chains and, and then obviously some support mechanisms that created temporary dis price distortions, um, particularly in the US. Um, but it is hard from, a, from an S&D perspective, um, given what we're seeing happen in terms of milk production, given what, we, what we're seeing happen in terms of demand, and also price action, to, to conclude that there is a strong evidence to suggest that prices will move outside their recent trading ranges. They've certainly performed better than perhaps we expected uh, back in uh, back in March or April, we are seeing weaker butter prices. That's that really, in my way of thinking about the market, means that the protein price will need to continue to perform well to drive expansion in the milk production. Um, if the butter price goes down, uh, then the protein stream really needs to perform to drive drive a milk price that will incentivise farmers to uh, to continue to grow their production of milk. As I've just said, we, we do focus on stocks at the origin, but um, we're not, and, and while there may be some anecdotal evidence that some markets might be building uh, stocks of commodities, we're not sure at this stage that that's a, a definite trend and um, it's not clear that we can make any conclusions in relation to that. And so from my perspective, you look at the dairy markets and you go, well, that's that's um, that's that's a perspective, um, and they look quite balanced. Uh, there is incentive to produce milk, um, but there's also a lot going on in the rest of the world, and as always, uh, and and so there's obviously some other things that could have a big impact on the marketplace. Um, and there's no question that economies are being impacted. If you if you think about uh, 
what's happened to global growth and and that's just a, a point in time but uh you know real gdp in q2 in the us was down nine and a half percent which is which is huge um the stimulus central banks and governments are making is key to avoiding market collapse and they've they've done that um and they're probably going to need to continue to do that how far they go will, is an open question but it's clear the central banks will go as far as they need to go and they've asked governments to do more the consequences of that will be will be further down the track but in in the in the short term that is there's no doubt that that, that action and activity has supported asset prices um, across the board in addition to that there's you know a lot of uncertainty around geopolitics there's these elections um, a month away and there's uh, some quite serious tension that's developing between us the us and china and that's going to be pretty have a pretty important impact on the direction of two two key issues from a dairy perspective the first one is i guess you could call it the trade war um, and and Australia is learning firsthand what happens when you get on the wrong side of China. Uh, China has now started an inquiry on Australia wines, um, which is a $1.2 billion export market for them. Uh, and they're making allegations around how uh, Australia is marketing those. And it seems that that's in response to Australia supporting a US position on an inquiry into what happened through the COVID period. China had already increased tariffs on barley, and just in the last few days, they have started to target the coal trade that occurs between China and Australia. That all seems to have happened pretty quickly, and while I expect that we in New Zealand will take a very neutral stance, no doubt the politics get more and more tricky, and the US election outcome will no doubt have a bearing on how that unfolds. Then there's the risk of uh, deglobalization. Uh, again, an issue that would take many years to unfold, but it does appear to be unfolding. Um, we have had a, been through a period over the last century of rapid globalization. Um, the rate of uh, export and trade was, was exponential all the way through to the period of 2007. Um, and, started to slow down if not um, stop in terms of growth uh, after the global financial crisis and so that will be interesting to see how that plays out whether countries um, start to uh, introduce tariffs or trade barriers um, will make uh, trade potentially more difficult and in addition to that lots of countries are starting to seek more self-sufficiency um, to protect their domestic economies um, as they grapple with increased inequality and, and so it won't be surprising to see that continue. Um, in terms of the US dollar, um, as a macro uh, price uh, point, uh, I think that it's fair to say that the US dollar has a huge impact on, on global trade and and has a huge impact on uh, commodity price valuations. Uh, in terms of the US dollar, it is at a pretty critical point. Um, typically, if you uh, get the US dollar direction right, um, then often, not always, many other things fall into place. Um, in the last uh, five year period or so, the dollar has been consistently strong uh, and uh, whilst a little bit volatile um, retained that strength through that period and that's that's sort of broadly put some pressure downward pressure on commodity prices as we came out of the out of the crisis um, and, and went through the period of, of high uncertainty the dollar dollar strengthened materially but since then at that point it's weakened quite a lot and um, as that weakness occurred uh, we saw whoops we saw agricultural commodities start to improve. Um, now there's obviously many, many supply and demand factors that go into each of these individual commodities, but you can see quite clearly that since the 
early part of August as the dollar weakened. Um, some of the key commodities like corn, sugar, um, wheat and soybeans have all seen price appreciation through that period. Um, I won't spend too much time, more time talking about that. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to what uh, Tommy from BlackRock has to say about commodity super cycles in, in the next few hours. Um, and so hopefully he has some, some insights onto whether we might enter the next uh, bull commodity market um, in 2021. Uh, so I could have I could have probably spent a lot of time looking at charts on macro indicators, but I think we can all agree that the impact of COVID-19 is not a positive for global growth, and the World Bank is projecting global growth to fall by about five five percent or so which is a pretty massive decline uh, across the globe. Central banks and governments have provided support to avoid a bigger crisis and that has supported asset prices. We've seen um, a large amount of support come into the US market um, for dairy farmers uh, and, and agricultural farmers across, across the board and that certainly helped um, support prices in, in that market. Let's hope that we glide smoothly out of this global event. I would say that's a possibility, but I'd also say the probability of a more bumpy exit is just as likely. And I think we'll see more volatility in currencies and commodities now that interest rates are basically zero in all the places where currencies of our trade are printed. On, on a bright note, um, we are in the business of producing a great food product that has many benefits and it is in demand. And so I remain pretty optimistic uh, about the outlook for the dairy market and I'd much rather be here talking to you about the outlook for the for the dairy industry than trying to present, present an update presentation about the airline industry right now. Um, and while with all of that, I probably wouldn't always say this. Um, I think right now I'd rather be managing risk um, than trying to forecast prices. Uh, I guess for those of you that are trying to do that, I'm hopeful that perhaps some of these uh, thoughts and, and insights are, are helpful in, in your pursuit of that. Uh, I know it's always very difficult um, and I wish you all the best with, uh, with trying to uh, figure out what's going to happen in these markets over the next 12 months. Um, so Nick, I'll, uh, I'll leave it there, I think, uh, and, and open it up for questions. Hopefully that gives us a bit of time for questions. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Um, it was insightful. We do have a few questions here. Uh, the top question at the moment. Uh, if further supply chain disruptions from COVID do not eventuate, will the higher inventory uh, in market create an overhang? Thoughts on that? Um, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I mean, clearly, if there, if there are higher inventories in, in built in market, uh, then, then an overhang will develop. Uh, I think that if we look at... Uh, China, for example, they they have been uh, uh, buying quite strongly, but equally they came out of the the uh, the COVID issue earlier than most others, and it would appear at least that they are in a much stronger position to um, to bounce out of that uh, through this through the next six months, given that they they don't seem to have had uh, a a re-emergence of issues. So, yeah, if if it's true, I guess it will. Um, as I said, I don't see real evidence that that's occurred yet. Okay. Um, and in the Farmgate milk price statement released in September, uh, FX hedging percentage was at 63. Uh, as at July, which is roughly 12% below typical. Has anything changed in the FX hedging policy? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Uh, so, and uh, that's a, a 
a piece of detail that I that I'm unable to speak on uh, specifically, but I'm I'm not aware of any changes to our FX head policy. Um, so next Sorry. question: uh, What are Fonterra's? <laughs> that's all right. What are what are Fonterra's uh, plans for Latin America uh, and specifically in Brazil? Um, I suppose uh, you know that's Latin America is still a very important dairy market. Uh, Fonterra strategically has clearly signalled that it is uh, going to uh, focus more on. Uh, New Zealand milk, uh, as you've seen, um, there have been divestments of assets uh, uh, to uh, to ensure that we can focus on uh, capturing the maximum value from our New Zealand milk. Um, and so I suspect that trend will continue. Does that mean that we have any intentions to do anything around um, assets in uh, Latin America? I, I, I don't know and I can't comment. Um, but strategically, our direction is to focus on New Zealand milk. Um, thanks for that. So you mentioned a bit about the uh, high levels of butter stocks in the US. How is uh, New Zealand's butter stocks looking or, or levels of fat stock? Yes, I think um, New Zealand stocks are uh, in check, but um, but it's, it's a more difficult market. Uh, to to retain balance in uh, the um, as I, as I said the the food service sector was impacted uh, materially that has recovered a lot in China which is which is a key market um, but in terms of uh, other major markets uh, there are clearly uh, issues in relation to obviously uh, the US itself um, as a destination for for milk fat products from New Zealand. Um, that market will be more difficult to operate in. Uh, there are issues in uh, in Iran and 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 Russia as well. Uh, so you know, broadly speaking, as I said, that market is under a little bit of pressure. I think we're, our our position has has improved a little bit over the last wee while. Um, we've seen um, GDT prices you know pick up a little bit, um, which is reflective of demand, as I said, coming back into the into the market. Um, Thanks. Um, yeah, I guess we've seen some interesting stuff out of Melbourne around day two, for example, around uh, the Daigu channel and things. But um, on balance, do you think that the, the COVID supply chain concerns have heightened reliance on oceanic supply up in Asia? Uh, to some extent, yes. Uh, clearly, I mean, as we went through this process and uh, I mean my view is that you know Fonterra has uh, and New Zealand has a supply chain set up that uh, that needs to move large volumes of product uh, you know from this country out into into the re into um, Asia in particular uh, that that supply chain was stressed there's no doubt about that uh, but it um but it continued to function pretty well um, and I, I believe that that would have given those markets confidence that we can uh, manage through these issues. Uh, and, and, you know, hopefully from our perspective, that gives them the confidence to continue to buy um, and, uh, and perhaps uh, push more demand to, to our part of the world. Uh, Um, and is, is packaging and product size a consideration uh, and ability to manufacture in smaller sizes for consumers? And further to that, wouldn't that impact uh, higher prices? Uh, but that's but high a... manufacturing delivery costs. Sorry, long question. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I don't know. I've heard I've heard mixed things about that. Uh, I've heard, I mean, obviously most of our product goes out in in a bulk format. Uh, I think uh, packaging and, you know, when, when we went through the crisis, uh, my view was at that stage that 
that was going to change consumer behaviour materially. Obviously, that was was pretty obvious. Um, there's been a, a huge shift away from out of home eating into uh, in home eating. Uh, the that that would mean that the form of the product that was uh, the form that the product need to take in terms of the supply chain was going to have to change. Uh, so instead of uh, having large capacities to produce a product that would be required for the food service sector, um, more product would need to be packaged into products that are that could uh, meet the needs of of the consumer end or the retail end of the sector. Um, so that said, I don't know if, if it's necessarily smaller sizes. Um, there, are, there, there was evidence to suggest that, for example, when there was certain concerns around hoarding, consumers were actually buying very quite, you know, larger pack sizes than they normally would have. Um, it's not really my area of expertise, to be quite honest. Um, but uh, I think that the one thing that we would have to acknowledge is that things are changing and the ability for your supply chain to, to adapt or, or be flexible is, is pretty critical. Um, otherwise, you just end up with inventory that you can't uh, move. Um, in your ethnic analysis you shared, at what stage did you factor in global food service demand uh, back to a more normal level? Um, I suppose we're starting to see, uh, you know, there's obviously, and I think some other people have talked about the shifts in the way that the food service sector deliv delivers product to customers, um, the delivery, the modes of delivery and delivery of, of product from restaurants has has, um, has uh, shifted, and and that's been done at quite a pace. Uh, in China, I think there was discussions yesterday uh, around how quickly that, that market has responded to uh, being able to or needing to deliver product to home um, and, and then go through that, that same um, through that same supply chain. In terms of what did we factor, um, I know like for China, we, we've obviously seen um, quite, quite good rebound uh, in, in that food service sector. Uh, I think we're less exposed to that sector in the large developed markets where there has been the biggest impact in terms of Europe and the US. Uh, and I'm not 100% sure if we've got the best view on that, uh, but our modelling sort of aligns pretty well with what we're seeing happen in terms of, uh, in terms of exports, commercial disappearance, which is, you know, essentially internal demand is, is something that I think everyone's been trying to grapple with. Uh, I don't know if our model would be perfect in that space. Okay. Um, and this question around government aid programs, I mean, whether it relates to Asia or the world at large, I know the US have got um, some fairly extensive government aid programs underway or purchasing programs. Um, might they be increasing demand and therefore consuming what might be considered normal under normal circumstances inventory build positions? Yeah, I, I haven't um, specifically heard of any particular government government aid programs that are going on where you know the the market is. Um, where governments are specifically outside of the US are specifically buying product. Um, to supply, so I'm not I'm not sure that's really a factor at this stage. Um, as I said, I think that there are governments that are that are uh, you know very focused on food security, um, but most of that still uh, ends up resulting in demand in in the private sector rather than governments specifically um, building their own stocks. Um, so I'm not seeing that happen at this stage. Okay. Well, thanks very much for that, Dave, answering those questions. Um, we're nearly at time, uh, but just a reminder of what we've got coming up. Uh, so we've got two speakers left for the seminar of a total of 11. Um, 
And the next two are, are quite highly topical and interesting. I've seen the slides for both and they look uh, pretty good. Uh, sea Forest is going to be talking about uh, how their seaweed supplement can pave the way for climate positive dairy products. Take us through the ins and outs of what they're doing there, uh, which could be a game changer. And um, obviously Dave mentioned BlackRock, uh, looking at the commodity super cycle. Where are we? Uh, where have we been in the past? And, and what does the future look like for that cycle? Uh, so thanks again, Dave. Uh, excellent insights and uh, really appreciate you giving the time as well as all those who have signed in. Uh, thank you and we'll see you on the next one. Thank you, Nick. Appreciate it. Goodbye.